When Francis Cabot Lowell first came to Waltham in 1813, no one dreamed he would shape the future of America. Lowell had an idea for an incredible machine, a power loom that could turn cotton threads into finished fabric at lightning speed. Never before had the country seen technology like this, but Lowell persevered. He built his machine in a great factory on the banks of the Charles River. And just as the echoes of nearby Lexington and Concord were fading, another era-shaping revolution was beginning in Waltham, the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution in the United States was very important in the sense that we had won our political independence. We still relied on foreign imports for most of our goods. And the Industrial Revolution allowed us to have our economic independence. It really did establish the way we live today with modern corporations and with our consumer culture. All of those things filter back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Well, the Industrial Revolution is really machine design, designing machines to do things that people used to do by hand. Weaving, done by hand before, done by machine afterwards. And of course, the advantages of that is it works so much faster. You can make so much more product that it reduces the cost of the product, increases sales, makes the material more available to more people, and that's, that's great progress. Waltham began a tradition of innovation that continues to the present day as textiles made way for the mass production of watches and clocks, precision machinery, bicycles, motorcycles and motor cars, the development of radar and instant photography right up to the leading edge of today's technologies. The one common thread that seems to pervade Waltham here is a culture of, of innovation and creativity that adapts to changing conditions. Every time something would go out of business, another industry would emerge. And so with the closing of the important Waltham watch factory, it was about the same time that the high-tech industry took hold. It's a vibrant community that has grown and changed and grown again. It's always been receptive to new ideas and it's been a very good partnership between the city and the entrepreneurs who come to the city to start businesses. It's a culture of Yankee ingenuity in the finest sense of the word. There are a lot of tinkerers here in Waltham, people that look to see how things work and how can they make it better. It's that culture of innovation that's been the real difference for Waltham. As the War of 1812 approached, Francis Cabot Lowell was a very wealthy man enjoying a two-year tour of Europe. Lowell made his home and fortune as an international merchant, an import-export trader whose ships sailed around the world. As the hostilities with the British again developed into war, Lowell realized that he needed to find a new occupation. During his travel overseas, his social connections opened the doors of the great textile mills of England and Scotland. Inside, Lowell paid rapt attention to the advanced technology. He became convinced that this was his destiny, to develop textile manufacturing in the United States on a scale never before attempted. It's interesting to note that it was the first integrated textile mill in the world, meaning that the spinning into yarn and the weaving of the yarn were all done in the same mill. The power loom was only invented about 1800. If you take a country like England, which had a well-developed textile industry in power carding, uh, power spinning, when you start getting power looms, you don't put them in the same mill. You build a new mill, maybe upstream, downstream. But here, uh, Francis Cabot Lowell is starting afresh. He knows he wants to do everything to make cloth. He doesn't want to build two buildings or three buildings, and so he builds one mill. But first, Lowell would have to have a power loom, such as those he had seen in England. Unfortunately, the British were extremely secretive about textile manufacturing. Not only did they refuse to sell their technology to America, they even prohibited textile workers from leaving England in order to protect their trade secrets. Francis Cabot Lowell, in seeing these uh, operations in England, was witness to something that very, very few people got a chance to look at. And again, it was only because of his standing as a part of the aristocracy of the United States. He memorized the, the plans. His ship was searched twice by the British. They found 
no evidence of plans or notes or anything. And then he got, came back to Boston and he immediately set to work on developing uh, a prototype of the power loom. He got together with a man named Paul Moody who built this equipment, never having seen it, only having seen a drawing that was made after the fact, and it worked. Paul Moody became very influential in helping to build the Boston Manufacturing Company from the mechanics point of view. In fact, the main street in Waltham is named Moody Street after Paul Moody. No one could have foreseen the forces of innovation Lowell unleashed in what was then a quiet country town. His textile factory, known as the Boston Manufacturing Company, was a pioneer, a prototype of the modern corporation. He located his textile mill along the Charles River in Waltham, and it marked a turning point for the country's industrial future. Within a few years, the factory was producing more than a half million yards of cotton cloth annually, generating incredible wealth. Lowell's vision became known as the Waltham system, emulated around the world. The Boston Manufacturing Company was also the first modern corporation in the sense that they sold shares of stock to investors and then those investors shared in the benefits uh, through dividends. At the time, the $400,000 that they raised through investors was incredible. To put that in perspective, most of the factories that were being built in that uh, time period were uh, costing anywhere from twenty to $30,000. So it was more than 10 times the scale of most factories that were being put up. It was an enormous undertaking. In order to find the workers for the uh, factory, girls would come in from the farms and they would find employment and they would have uh, actual wages they would be earning, but they were also charged for their room and board, which came out of their salary, which was certainly rather meager. Their families would be reassured that these girls would be under supervision, live in boarding houses during their off hours. But even so, it was still an attractive option for them to come to Waltham and work in the factories. They had more freedom than what they had ever had before, money in their pocket, and yet they were in a protected environment. This helped to develop what became known as the Waltham system. In 1851, Aaron Dennison had established a factory in Roxbury near Boston to manufacture watches using interchangeable parts. Dennison soon found that Roxbury's urban atmosphere with its thick dust and choking smog was detrimental to the precision required in watch manufacturing. By 1854, Dennison found the ideal setting for the most ambitious watch factory ever built, the peaceful banks of the Charles River in Waltham. Waltham Watch started in Roxbury, and then because of dusty roads and so forth, they moved out to the clean air of Waltham. Two main reasons for Waltham Watch coming out here is one, they got a wonderful deal on a lot of land. Secondly, they were millwrights, they were machinists, there was the kind of talent they needed for their factory located here in Waltham. And in large part, I think, because of the textile mill. Dennison's venture eventually became the Waltham Watch Company, one of America's most important and innovative manufacturing enterprises. For years, timepieces were made mostly by hand, with individual craftsmen creating and assembling the delicate parts in a painstaking process only the wealthy could afford. The Waltham Watch Company revolutionized timekeeping by producing reliable, high-grade watches for a low price, allowing everyone to own what was once a luxury. Their secret was in using machines to create precise, identical parts, which meant every Waltham watch was exactly the same as another of the same design. The market for watches exploded after the Civil War, and for a while, two out of three watches sold in America were Walthams. In the 100 years of its operation, the Waltham Watch Company manufactured 35 million watches. When the watch factory first started here in Waltham, it was only a few years before the American Civil War, 
and Waltham watches uh, were a rather prized item. Uh, they kept accurate time. There was a watch produced that was reasonable enough so that families who were sending their sons off to the war could provide them with a Waltham watch. Waltham watches uh, became very well known throughout the world as a trustworthy timepiece and various expressions uh, sprang up uh, such as he's as trustworthy as a Waltham watch. Waltham's industries took off after the establishment of the Waltham Watch Company. The American machine tool industry grew from the watch company's demand for precision manufacturing. Having a lot of industry provides employment, attracts other industries. Note what came with the Waltham Watch Company. Makers of watchmaking machinery became a center for machine tools, particularly uh, precision lathes, gear cutting machinery, which would be, be used in the watch and clock industry. And when you have one industry in town attracting other industries, then other industries come who can benefit from these services, and the whole thing grows. Enterprises sprang up to support or compete against the company, including the Howard Clock Company and O'Hara Dial Gauge Company. Many of Waltham's later industrial endeavors, from the first crayon factory to automobiles and airplanes, can be traced back directly to the influence of the Waltham Watch Company. In the 1880s and 90s, the Orient Manufacturing Company developed the Orient Bicycle, which at the time was a craze. It was the first time that anybody had actually had an independent means of transportation. That manufacturing entity eventually became the Metz Car Company, and they uh, went from bicycles into cars. They were manufactured here in Waltham. And uh, a few miles down the river in Cambridge, uh, Henry Ford established a, a Model T assembly plant right on the banks of the Charles River. So this area was, uh, in the early part of the 20th century, a real significant transportation manufacturing center. Waltham's tradition of innovation has put the city at the center of the high technology phenomenon. It began in the late 1920s when a modest vacuum tube manufacturer called Raytheon established a plant in Waltham on the site of the old Howell Button factory. Raytheon revolutionized the use of the radio with their invention of the rectifier tube. Soon, almost everyone in the U.S. owned a set, and this popularity gave rise to the era of mass communication, with nationwide programming captivating the public imagination. During World War II, Raytheon developed the techniques to mass-produce magnetron tubes, the essential component of radar systems. In the post-war era, the company invented the microwave oven and perfected the transistor, and eventually became one of the country's leading defense contractors. The cavity magnetron has a big block of, ca of copper with a large diameter hole in the middle, and coming off that, a lot of little holes going around. And you get the electrons to spin around in the big cavity, and they excite microwaves in the small cavities, and there's your microwave energy, which you need for your radar. The British made it by taking a big block of copper and drilling a hole here and boring a hole there and turning the whole thing, a rather slow process. Percy Spencer's idea is stamp the stuff out of sheet copper and stack them up. And there is a fine cavity magnetron with none of this time-consuming lathe operations to make that copper block. And that's what Raytheon did for that industry and gave Raytheon a leg up in the radar business. Waltham definitely became a, a working man's city um, with a lot of industry. And one of those new businesses was Raytheon. That was here before World War II started. And it was going night and day during the war. I remember when I was a child coming down to this area and the lights were on 24-7 at Raytheon. There was a shift coming and going uh, at various times of the day. It was a, uh, a very important resource, very important to the war effort. Raytheon introduced Waltham to the world of high tech, but the 1951 completion of America's first Beltway Highway, Route 128, made Waltham the address for the country's technology enterprises prior to Silicon Valley. Near the end of the 1950s, I 
happened to, I went to Germany for three years. And when I came back in 61, I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw 128, which had been just a, a road. And now was suddenly this uh, highway, this major um, technological highway with more businesses than uh, you could shake a stick at. There was one right after the other after the other. The whole city had changed. Route 128 was the first completed uh, circumferential highway in the United States and it was uh, a marvel to behold. It changed the pattern of the way people live in many, many ways. It allowed industries to expand out into the suburbs. Not only could you get your raw materials here and ship uh, the finished products out very conveniently and cheaply, but it was also a place where your employees could live in the city or they could live west of the city, they could live north or south, and it was a, it was a very convenient location. Through the years, Waltham has hosted such technology leaders as Polaroid Corporation, GTE, Thermo Electron, Foster Miller, AstraZeneca Pharmaceuticals, Nova Biomedical, and hundreds of others. Industry may be Waltham's identity, but Waltham's people have given the city its character. And not all of Waltham's notable people have been industrialists. Many have been patriots and prominent civic leaders, such as Christopher Gore, Massachusetts Senator and Governor in the Federalist era. War heroes and politicians like Nathaniel Banks, who worked his way up from bobbin boy at the Waltham Cotton Factory to Civil War General, Massachusetts Governor, and Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. As well, famous philanthropists and philosophers such as Annie Payson Call, Theodore Lyman, Robert Treat Payne, and Cornelia Warren, each has left their mark in Waltham history and culture. And then there are the unsung heroes of Waltham, the everyday people who labored in the factories, raised their families, and made Waltham into a thriving community. The Waltham Watch Company became uh, very large, very influential in the city, and many, many people that lived here in Waltham worked for the Waltham Watch Factory. This helped the whole culture of the city develop. No matter what your interest was, there was probably a club or an organization that you could belong to through your employment, through your job. Uh, they had bowling leagues, musical groups, there was canoeing on the Charles, there were races on the Charles River. There were just many, many social organizations that the employees of the Waltham Watch Company participated in. It contributed greatly to the social life of the city. Over the years, Waltham has been a melting pot of many ethnic cultures and immigrants. All these ethnicities have blessed Waltham with a vibrancy that continues to be reflected in the city's cuisine and culture. Since the birth of the Industrial Revolution, on up to the dawn of high tech, and now into the future, the city of Waltham is surely the gateway to history.